Welcome to Slater Baptist Church. We exist to glorify God in worship, grow in our love for Christ through intentional relationships, and go into our community and around the world with the gospel. So until further notice, all church events have been postponed. Uh, This is what we'll be doing for the next few weeks. We'll be meeting together as house churches. Uh, And so Scott and I would like to encourage you to invite others uh, to be a part of your house groups, to invite others to join you. Um, The the tricky part about that is we do need to keep those groups to less than 10 people. Uh, So if you'd like to invite others, we would encourage you to do so, but please uh, be in touch with Scott and I. We will be more than happy to rearrange things, to shuffle folks around, to make sure that we can invite other folks into it. Uh, but also to make sure that we keep those groups under 10 people. So this is a really critical time for our church, a time where we can actually uh, be intentional to grow in Christ through intentional relationships. Uh, And so we want to invite other people into that. We want to see people grow in Christ through this time during these next couple of weeks uh, as we are intentional with our relationships in these house groups. Uh, So without further ado... Let's begin. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. 
O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you.
Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil.
Well, good morning, everybody. We, uh, we would love nothing more than to be able to meet with all of you this morning, uh, but we want to, hopefully you saw the YouTube uh, post that we made earlier in the week, but we want to be careful to honor the requests uh, that our government has given us because this gives us an opportunity to display to the world what it looks like to submit to authorities. So here's, uh, this is the format that we're going to be doing for at least this week and next week, and we'll play it by ear and see how things kind of go forward. Uh, in addition to the, to the change of how we're going to do this on Sunday mornings, we're also going to change the content. So we're actually going to be spending just a few weeks moving through fear and anxiety. And I really wanted to start with actually a book, uh, a quote from a book that I've read a couple of times now, and I've referred to it. If you've never read it, it's a really great book. The name of it is Running Scared by Ed Welch. Uh, the subtitle is Fear, a Worry, and the God of Rest. And I just wanted to read a paragraph very quickly as we start discussing. Here's what it says. Here's the proposal. Let fear point us to the knowledge of God and let the Spirit of God, by way of Scripture, teach us the knowledge of God. When fear is the problem, our typical approach is to follow action steps. If we're on our spiritual game, we can pray with thanksgiving. We can cast our cares on Him or we can heed His command to not be afraid. These are good things, but they are responses to our growing knowledge of God. The knowledge of God comes first. Apart from this personal knowledge, scriptural advice is no different from the thought stoppage or imaginary vacations that secular treatments offer. If fear is a personal matter, we must set off to know a person. So we wanted to actually stop our series in Genesis for a while and just talk through fear and how we as the church can take advantage of a really key time in the life of our culture to help address fears. Now, uh, because I am an incredibly extroverted person, and the idea of speaking to an empty room is just the opposite of what I would normally do, uh, what we wanted to do is David and I are going to take turns back and forth each week, leading a discussion with each other through what we're moving through. So this week and next week, we're going to move through Psalm 27. I would stop for a minute and, take, and tell you to, to flip in your Bibles to Psalm 27, but literally you can just hit the pause button. So I'm not going to do that. You can pause at any point and get to Psalm 27 and we'll start back. Ready? Okay, hopefully that's where you paused. Here we are, Psalm 27. I want to read the first six verses uh, and then we're going to set some context and we'll go from there. Here's what it says. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and my foes, it's they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I have asked of the Lord that that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple, for he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. So this is, this is written by David, and uh, I think the first thing to remember as we're thinking about this, it's always helpful to think about the fact that psalms are written by real people, yeah. addressing real problems, and if anybody in the world had stuff to be afraid of, it was David. David had a lot of stuff to be afraid of. Yeah. I mean, honestly, if you look at the story of his life, he starts out running from, from Saul, right, the, the king who wants to kill him, yeah. right? Well, then later on in his life, you're going to hear about him running from Absalom, his own son, who wants to kill him, and then he's going to, he's going to to have enemies all around him, all of whom want to kill him, and then finally, he's going to, going to just completely disregard the law of God, and, uh, and then covered up by killing a person, and ultimately, the, the threat before him was that really what he deserved by God was to be killed, and so seeing the sin in his own life, and seeing the people around him who were pursuing him, he had lots of reasons to be afraid. Mm. And what's, what's fascinating about it is it's good for us to remember, you know, the Bible says so much about not being afraid, precisely because we are a fearful people. 
You know, one of the one of the helpful things in, in that book was actually Ed Welch says, you know, we're we're a people built to be afraid. The problem is not that we're afraid, the problem is that we're afraid of the wrong things. The wrong things, yeah, right. Certainly. Yeah, and so so the so the first six verses really kind of set the table of this of what what do we do? What does David teach us about how to respond to fear? Because if there's anything that um, you're seeing, if you spend any time on social media, if you spend really any time talking to people, if you spend any time looking for toilet paper this week, then you have, uh, you have discovered that, that we are a people who somehow are just covered up in fear. Mm. You know, and part of, I think, what makes this particular thing so difficult is it's fear of the unseen. You know, like this is an mm. unseen enemy. It's something that you can't put your eyes on. And uh, nothing quite attacks our faith, which ought to be in the unseen hand of God, quite like an unseen enemy. Yeah, yeah. And so it's really fascinating to, to see how that works. But I think David teaches us a lot about how we can respond to fear. And, and I think you walk verse by verse through this. There are four things. I know I always usually do threes, but I got four for you today. Uh, four things that we can see, statements that we can make that can help us uh, when we are afraid, uh, because ultimately when we're afraid, we must trust God. Yeah. It's really not more complicated than that, but it is really hard. And, uh, and all of us will have some sort of fear. So I think the first thing in verse 1, as he talks through it, is, is just the reminder that God is greater than whatever I am afraid of. Uh, so there's three ways that David describes the Lord in verse 1. Number one, the Lord is my light, that you know, we think of, of, of exactly what that means, the idea of, of everything around is dark, and he provides light mm-hmm. so that ultimately, I don't think even so much so that we can see our circumstances clearly, I think God provides light or is light so that we can see him clearly mm-hmm. in the midst of our circumstances. And by that, see everything else. Exactly. Yeah, it's the, what is the, oh, it's the C.S. Lewis, is that the C.S. Lewis quote? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, I believe from, in God uh, as I believe in the sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His, uh, his meditations from a woodshed. You know, he talks yeah. about how he's, he's in this dark woodshed, and then this shaft of light comes in, you know, through this crack above the door. And he says, at first, I could just, I could see almost nothing in the shed except that shaft of light. You know, I could see nothing but this light. And then he walks, and he gets... He, gets, he puts his head into the shaft of light, and he said, suddenly, the woodshed was gone. Mm. I could just see the flowers and the trees mm. and the sun. Mm. You know, he says, I could, I could see all of these things because I was in the light, and suddenly all the darkness just vanished. Yeah. You know, that's, so good. That's, a, that's a glorious illustration, right, of what of what David is talking about. The Lord is my light. You know, it's so interesting that he asks, whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? You know, you, you can take that as, as no one. You know, you could also take that as you know, the person he should be afraid of, the person he should fear is the Lord. The Lord, yeah, that's yeah. good. Yeah, and then as, as we see God as light, then we also see him as salvation, right? So mm. he's, he becomes clear, he makes... He makes himself clear to us by opening our eyes. We respond to that through repentance and faith, and then we go through seasons of difficulty, hardship, suffering like this, so that the things that would distract us and detract us from seeing him clearly help us uh, kind of fall away so that we can see uh, that he provides salvation for his people. I think if there's any message that is most powerful um, in, in times of hardship, unprecedented, things we've never seen before, things we've never experienced before. It's not just that, that this world is going to get better. You know, I think you're going to see a precipitous decline in the efficacy of the prosperity gospel over the next couple of weeks, you know, to, to the point that I, I read a story. I'm not going to name the church because that would just be wrong. But I read a story about a church that, was, um, that had healing rooms mm. that actually closed down the healing rooms Due, during this event. Due to this event. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, well, what a terrible irony. You know, but it speaks volumes because that our salvation, our hope is not that even this will pass. It's not that this will get better. It's not that there will be some economic upturn at the end. The hope is that Christ has come and purchased men for God. 
and that he is our salvation. So, of course, I don't have to be afraid. It's the, it's the same thing the Bible asks, like, why are you afraid of men who can only destroy the body? Fear God, who can destroy both body and soul, right? He is our salvation. And then finally, he, he, he says, the Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You know, he is the one who holds me fast. I think, I think particularly for a lot of folks, the financial side of this, um, is where we're going to have to really hold on to that stronghold idea. You're going to see a lot of people that are going to endure great loss as a result of this, or at least there's the potential Certainly. for that. And so I think, you know, number one is just remembering God is, is greater. You know, he is light, he is salvation, he is stronghold. And whatever it is that I'm afraid of, God is, is greater than that. It sounds overly simplistic, but it's really true to constantly remind yourself of the greatness of God. I think the next thing is the psalmist transitions. Uh, he starts telling these stories in verse 2 and 3. And, and they're not just things that just kind of could have theoretically happened. You know, it's not like David says, theoretically, when evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh. No, that really happened in David's life, you know. Multiple he times. Yeah, he doesn't say in, in verse 3, theoretically, though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. No, armies actually encamped against him. And, and in fact, his own armies encamped against him in, in, this, in the story of Absalom. And so you've got these pictures of exactly how God has proven himself in the past. And I think the second thing that David does for us is he, he reminds himself, God is light, salvation, stronghold. Here's how I know that that's true, because these things have already happened in my life. I've seen him do these things. And the two examples are, are really clear. Number one is, I think if I'm going to boil it down, it's going to be when people mean evil for me, God uses it for good. Mm. You know, that mm. doesn't mean profit. It doesn't mean prosperity. It means ultimately whatever, whatever is happening in my life is happening so that I will look more like Jesus. We've said that a couple of times on Sunday mornings and Sunday school and sermons that yeah. I can't tell you exactly why God's doing something, but I can tell you why he's doing something. He's doing it to make you look more like Jesus. Well, I mean, it's rooted in, in Genesis, in the story of Joseph, right? Like mm. his, his, 12, yeah. you know, his 11 brothers you know, sell him into slavery. He gets thrown into prison, and then God is able to use that yep. to bring salvation to an entire world. Yep. And then, you know, his brothers afterwards, after their father dies, they think, man, this is, this is Joseph's chance. He, he finally has us. You know, he's, he's in charge of all this. You know, we did all of these things to him in the past. Our father is dead. Now now's going to be the time. Right. Now is going to be the time when he's going to get his just desserts on us. Right. And so they come to him and they, they make this little speech about how, you know, dad always wanted us to, you know, be a family and dad always wanted us to be be together, and dad, da, da, and Joseph, you know, sees right through it and says, listen, what God, what you intended for evil, God meant for good. Yep. You know, that's, that's the story that we see repeated over and over and over and over again right. in Genesis and in the Bible, right. that God takes these broken circumstances, these broken people, he uses them for good. And we can, you know, that's, that's part of what David is, is doing here. Yeah. You know, he's, you know, he, we talk today, we talk in today's times about looking back for evidences of grace. Mm -hmm. You're looking back for those monuments of grace yep. in our lives yep. that, that shore up our faith. Yep. You know, that cause us to believe and have faith today. Because we know if God was faithful to us back there, God is the same God. He's still going to be faithful to us today. You know, and I'm, I'm so happy that in the midst of this, I know that I serve a faithful God. Yeah, I think that's the thing, right, is we have, listen, if you, you have every reason in the world to be afraid right now if you don't know God. Amen. I, I, Amen. That, I think that's the point is, of course, of course the world is going to be afraid. It ought not surprise us that the world is afraid, right? Is, so, and then the second example yeah, kind of comes along with the first one, but I think when I boiled it down, I got, when the whole world feels uncertain, I am confident in him. Like, I've never been a king. I've never had an army. But I can imagine that if I'm the king of a small nation and big nations are all around me with big armies and they're trying to come in, I feel a little uncertain. I think uncertainty is a thing that I would feel. I think the second example really kind of resonates with us. There's just so much uncertainty. The thing that scares us the most is the unknown. You know, we're always, we're always scared. 
we're always the most scared of the thing we just don't know. You know, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if next week I'm going to be able to go and get groceries for my family. I don't know if a few weeks from now um, everything's still in total systemic shutdown and I don't have a paycheck. Like, I don't know. Those are all things that we don't know. What we do know is that God is what? Light, salvation, stronghold. And because I know that and because I've seen him be those things in my life, in the past, I know that he'll be those things for me through this and in this. And so I think David leans on those examples. And then, the, you know, so he's proven himself in the past. And you get to verse 4 and 5, and he just talks about worship, you know, that he's asked of the Lord that he might dwell in the house of the Lord, so he gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. And then he reminds himself, he will hide me in his shelter. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And I think that what this kind of comes down to is you've got this reminder. Proverbs says it beautifully when it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. At the end of the day, I said at the beginning that Ed Welch says, you know, we're all people built to be afraid. The problem is not that we're afraid. The problem is that we're afraid of the wrong thing. And really, the only antidote to fear is fear. The only antidote to unhealthy fear is knowledge of God and fear of God. If we truly fear God the right ways, then it pushes out the, the, the wrong fears because right fear and wrong fear can't really live in the same space. You know, they just, they just don't cohabitate. It's like, it's like darkness doesn't live in a room when I flip the light on. There's light, you know, and it's the same sort of thing. Is this picture of, of, you know, he has this hope, which is to dwell in the Lord's house. Our hope is not that this gets better in two weeks or three weeks, and our hope is not that all, everything gets back to normal in a few weeks and we can all just forget about this big mess. Our hope is that one day we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, the desire then for our lives is to look at the beauty of the Lord, to see him in his splendor. And even in the midst of this, uh, this situation, like one of the discussion questions I'm asking the, the house church leaders to, to go through is how can we see the beauty of the Lord in the midst of a situation like this? Like, What do you see happening? And I think as Christians, we're called to not just look for those things in our lives, but to look for them in the world and to pull them out and celebrate them because the world is in chaos. The culture is a wreck right now, but for us to be able to say, let me show you this beautiful thing about God in the middle of all of this uncertainty is just so unique and it just so reminds us we're called to fear him. He's still working. None of this catches him off guard. He's completely aware of that. He has been completely aware from the foundations of the world that this thing is going to happen this way at this time, and it's part of his plan. It's not thwarting his plan. It's part of his plan. And so I can remind myself of his wisdom and seek it, right? I can look for his wisdom. In verse 4, it talks about to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. In other words, if I don't know what to do, you know, James, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God and it will be given, you know? And so these are times where we, even as leaders, have had to pray this week about how we would lead this church in this time. You know, what it would look like, because this is different, and it's pretty uncomfortable for people, and it's, and it's new, and, and we want to honor the, you know, the, the requests that have been made, but we still want to lead people well, we want to give people the opportunity to gather and meet, this is all, there's no, I didn't take a seminary class on how to do this, I don't think you did either. Nope. You know, there, were no, nope. there's, there was no pandemic 101 class, <laughs> it's just, you know, here, here we are trying to figure out what to do with it, so what do we need? We need the wisdom of the Lord. To inquire of the wisdom of the Lord first starts with gazing at at his beauty, really considering the beauty of God. And then from there, we're able to get wisdom. And so finally, the last thing is, is that the result in verse 6 when he stops, and you'll pick up verse 7 next week indeed, and lead us through this discussion. But verse 6, it says, And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. So he just stops and worships. And I think that is the ultimate challenge for us in this passage is that fear will always result in worship, always result in worship. So good fear, healthy fear, right fear of the Lord, where I'm gazing on the beauty of the Lord and inquiring of his temple, where I'm seeking the wisdom of God, that will always result in this type of worship. That's, that's the, not, the natural outflow of re, me remembering you are God in heaven and I am not, so let my words be few. In other words, I'm going to gaze at your beauty, I'm going to seek your wisdom, I'm going to submit myself to your plan, your will, and as a result, worship, which we talk, if you've been through new members class, you know, it's the response to the truth and grace that God gives us. And so 
that's going to happen. But here's the other part of this, is that wrong fear will also result in worship. If I'm fearing wrongly, if, if, I'm, if I'm fearing my circumstances, if I'm fearing the, the, the uncertainty of what's happening right now is driving me to fear, then whereas the, the passage teach us that I will rejoice in the shelter of God, if I'm fearing wrongly, I'm going to try to build my own little flimsy shelter. To, to try to cover and, and sacrifice, my, you know, to, to, to cover myself. It's, it's not far from the garden. I'm going to sow some flimsy fig leaves on yep. and try to hide myself, you know. And so it's the equivalent of, I said this earlier today, we were talking about this, it's, it's, like, it's like trying to put a pup tent up in the middle of a hurricane and thinking that that's going to protect me from the storm. You know, that's what happens when I try to build my own little sense of security in the midst of an uncertainty that God has wrought on the world. My hope has got to be in him. My fear has got to be in him. And so if I'm fearing wrongly, then I'm going to worship my own ability to provide for myself, and I'm going to try to build my own temple. If I'm, if I'm worshiping wrongly, then whereas the passage says, I'm going to shout with joy in my tent. In other words, I'm going to shout for joy that God is going to provide even in the midst of a storm, even in the midst of difficulty. If I'm fearing wrongly, then instead of, doing, instead of shouting at the goodness of God, I'm going to be shouting and shaking my fist at God. Why have you done this to me? Why have you put me in these circumstances? Why are you doing this to us? And, and I'm going to fail to, to submit my life rightly. And so I'm worshiping my own perceived rights, which is self-worship, right? And, so, and then the last one is, is you know, in, in the middle of difficulty, he says, my head shall be lifted up above my enemies around me. So God's the lifter of my head even in the midst of difficulty. And instead of me lifting my head up, in the midst of great difficulty, and looking at my neighbors and saying, let me give you a reason for my hope, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be, you know, cowering in fear, downtrodden, downtrodden afraid, afraid to interact with the culture around me and say, there is a reason to be hopeful, and it's not the economy, and it's not physical health, and it's not even social interaction. The reason for my hope is Jesus Christ, the hope of glory, and that right fear will result in worship, but fear itself always results in worship. So that's been our, our prayer for you all as you've met this morning, as you've kind of moved through probably one of the most weird weeks any of us have ever had, is that we will fear rightly and that this whole circumstance at the end of the day will cause each one of us to love Jesus more because of it. So that when we get to the point where we're gathering together again as a church, we can literally say, I'm not glad for the, for the, for the, for the bad, but I am so glad for the good that was wrought through the bad. So glad for the, the way that I've been challenged in my faith to grow. So, so that's... We can say, along with Joseph, you know, what, what the world meant for evil, evil. Yep. God used for good. Yep. So I hope you guys will take this time after the recording is over. After, so we're gonna, I'm going to pray for us in just a moment. And just we, we teed up some discussion questions that your house group leaders have. Um, that you can talk through and think through together as a group. I want to encourage you to do that. The thing that's going to be the, the, the thing that YouTube can't do is true biblical fellowship. And you've got the opportunity to do that this morning in your groups. I hope that you'll take advantage of it. You, some of you guys have kiddos in your groups. Like, I'm going to have kiddos in my group. I think you've got kiddos in yours. I want to encourage you, get the kids involved and, and ask them some questions. Figure out ways to simplify these questions. They're they're kid-friendly and that they're good questions, but you might have to figure out how to reword them a little bit. But get the kids involved in thinking about this. What a critical time for our children to get to see us respond in faith to something that, quite honestly, they may never see again for the rest of their lives. So let's take advantage of this teachable moment, teach our children, and talk to them on a level that they can understand, and then encourage to share, spend some time with each other. I hope that you guys will have a sweet time of fellowship today. It, it absolutely breaks my heart uh, that this is being recorded in a room where I would normally be sitting here or standing there and get to see all you guys' faces. Like, I look around in the room, and I literally know where most of you would be. And, uh, and it makes my heart sad that I'm not going to get to be with you on Sunday. But I surely hope that you guys know we love you. We're praying for you. And if there's any way we can serve you, we, we want to do so. So let me just pray for us, and then uh, we'll have the discussion questions. They're going to show up in the PowerPoint, and they're also going to be in the comment section uh, underneath um, where you're looking at the video. If you'll scroll down a little bit, there's a comment section, and the questions will all be written there as well. So let me pray for us, and then you guys can start discussing. Father, we thank you for your word. 
And Lord, what encouragement to know uh, that you, you expect fear because we are fallen uh, and we are sinful and you are so rich in mercy and grace uh, that you have given us whole passages of the Bible dedicated to helping us confront and deal with our fears. Lord, I pray uh, that we would remember you as our light, as our salvation, and as our stronghold. Uh, and Lord, as we do so, uh, that we would take action in our lives and in our hearts, push out fear by knowing you more. I pray that through this circumstance, our congregation and all Christians, the Christians in this world, would take the opportunity to give a reason for their hope, to fasten their hope, all of their hope in you, uh, to stop trying to build tents or flimsy covers, but to run to you as our stronghold and as the reason for our strength. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the folks who made the decision this morning to gather in house churches, Lord. I thank you for the reality that even though we're in groups of 10, we are a united body of believers. And I pray, Father, that we would feel that in a very real and tangible way this morning as we gather together. I love these people, uh, Father, and I thank you for them. And we all love you. And we are grateful for the hope of the gospel. And we pray that you grant us the opportunity to share that hope with our neighbors, with our coworkers, with the folks in the grocery store. Uh, Lord, help us to look for opportunities to talk about your goodness and to proclaim your gospel to the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we love you guys. God bless. We'll see you soon.